This is the BBC. Thanks for downloading this edition of Crossing Continents. I'm Helen Grady and I'm one of the producers here at the BBC in London. About a year ago, I was in Kenya and I met a woman who described herself as an LGBTI activist. I knew what LGBT stood for, but I was like, what's the I? That was the first time I heard the word intersex. And as she explained to me about who these people are and the struggles they face in Kenya, I decided I wanted to make a programme about them. So I teamed up with the brilliant Kenyan journalist Anne Soy. She's BBC Africa's health correspondent and she spent months and travelled miles tracking down the people you're about to hear from. This is our programme. The boys are playing football yeah. and the girls on the side are playing a local game <laughs> called Kati. Oh, I miss Kati. Yeah. When you were growing up, that would have been difficult for you because the girls are playing on one side and the boys on the other side. It would be difficult for you to Yeah, choose. yeah, yeah. It was, it was very, very difficult. For this week's Crossing Continents, I'm in Western Kenya with a person who's hard to define. Apostle Dalan Ruki is tall but elegant. He takes long, confident strides but moves gracefully across the playground. Oh, not now me. <laughs> <laughs> he got hit by the ball. He's supposed to avoid being... He's been hit again. He's supposed to be out of the game now. Apostle Dallan is a successful gospel singer who's founded a church and built a home for widows and orphans. It's a place where he's accepted in a way he wasn't as a child. And we are off to the boys' side now. No, well, these boys are good. They can pass the ball. Oh, wow, snap. Ah. I thought you were going to score. <laughs> I like playing with these children. I could see that. Those are my joy because during my childhood, I didn't get anybody to play with me. Uh. I was so disparate. I don't want to pay back the loneliness I had. Apostle Dallan is one of a handful of Kenyans who publicly identify as intersex. That's the term most commonly used here to describe people whose bodies don't fit the typical definitions of male or female. It's thought there could be as many as a million intersex people in Kenya. Over the past year, a few of them, like Dallan, have come out to talk about their lives and the stigma they've faced, sparking a national debate about their rights. But in a country where most people have traditional views about sex and gender, it's still rare to meet one who's so open and flamboyant. Your outfits are quite spectacular. I've been here for less than two hours and I've seen you in two different outfits, all flowing. Yeah. So I can see it's several pieces. Yeah, the, the, I have so a trouser. There's a trouser inside. Inside. And then... A skirt here. There's a coat. Yeah. Which is long. Yeah. Right. It symbolizes who I am, my intersex, because I'm a man and I'm a woman. I'm proud of both. Yeah, I can, I can see you've also done your hair. Is, is that a weave? No, no. I have no natural hair. And evidently you also have some lip balm on. Yeah. I can tell that um, you've applied some, some powder on your face. Yeah, I do makeup sometimes. I decided to come out so that everybody should know who I am. Me, I was born an intersex and this is how I am and uh, this is how God created me. How do you like to be referred to? Do we say him or her? So it's just okay anyway. A he or a she. You're fine I'm with either. I'm just fine with either. How do you react when you see somebody so confused? Like, he, 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 you know? It can be confusing. I know that it is not normal in the eyes of people, but it has happened. <laughs> but it wasn't always a laughing matter, especially for Apostle Dallan's mother. I I hid the child because in our tradition, the Luo people would kill such a child if they discovered it was intersex. I was scared if I left him alone, someone would kill him. So I kept him with me at all times. So that means he used to go everywhere with Dallan? Yes, I'd walk everywhere with him. When he was going to school, I'd go with him. I wouldn't even allow him to go take a bath with his peers at the lake. I prepared a safe place at home where he could take his bath. That's because traditionally people go to the lake to bathe. 
you know, mm-hmm. men at their own time, women at their own time, but your child did not fit into either that group. He was not accepted by the girls or the boys. To keep him safe, he had to take his bath at home. His peers never wanted to play with him. So he had to play by himself by the riverside. He was always alone. It was painful, but there was nothing I could do. Western Kenya is a place where traditional beliefs like those of the Luo tribe run alongside a strong Christian faith. Every gathering here starts with a prayer, and the monthly meeting of the Ten Beloved Sisters is no exception. I've been invited to meet these powerful women, traditional birth attendants, who know everything going on in their village, from who's had a miscarriage to who's courting and who's intersex. Once again, the river is the local grapevine. That river behind us there. Yes, there's a river yeah, uh, yeah, about yeah. 100 meters from here. People just bathe openly. And if you see something which is a little bit different, that's where they go speak. Started. Oh, did you see something? Eh? Mm. So the such people, they were afraid of going there where many people are there. They go too early or too late while well, people are, mm. are not there so that they can take their bath. So they bathe and look. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And compare. Yeah, you compare. <laughs> that's normal. That's normal. Mm-hmm. Where people bathe together, even if you are normal. Mm. One must look at the other person. Yeah, yeah, that's normal. <laughs> However, you are created, mm, yes. you are big buttocks, mm. you are brown. Mm. Those things are being seen. Mm. Uh, if you you bend, backside is seen. You should be seeing there. Mm. That's where you will find someone saying, eh, that woman, when she bent, I saw something like too big, too a stick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where people start gossiping. Even women. There are some who are not intersex. But between the vagina, there is something created too big. Too big. Mm. Yeah, mm. The clitoris. You see it that much out. detail? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's how human beings are. <laughs> the ten beloved sisters have obviously seen it all. They are unshockable. So I dare ask them a sensitive question. These days, most mothers give birth in hospital to reduce the risk of HIV transmission. But not long ago, traditional midwives had the power of life or death in their hands, literally. So how did their predecessors deal with newborn babies whose gender wasn't clear? I should warn you, the answer is disturbing. They used to kill them, even they you are not even allowed to the community to know what what had happened there. You just tell that the child was born and the, the child is dead. If this baby, like uh, the intersex, was born, if that one was seen, it was like a curse. Automatically, it was like a curse. The baby dies. The baby just dies. They kill them. They used to kill them. How? It was obvious the intersex baby could not breathe one cry. No, you may not know whether she was a, a girl or a boy. You will remain knowing I gave birth to a dead baby. Is there a traditional term they were using for killing? Because I'm sure they were not saying we killed the baby. Tororabuam, tororabuam. Tororabuam. Yeah, tororabuam. Wakati manamuke amezam toto intersex, the old woman alikuwa na chukwa viasi hii viasi tamu anavunja anaweka kwa kichwa ya mtoto anavunja hivi alafu mtoto anakufa so they used to take a sweet potato mm-hmm. and put it on the baby's yeah, head yeah. and anavunja. break it break mm-hmm. it once once yeah. and that kills the baby that mm-hmm. kills the baby so, mm-hmm. were they saying they, they've killed the baby or they just say that tumevunja viazi so the traditional bath attendants used to say we have broken the sweet potato yeah. mm-hmm. so it's it's euphemism mm-hmm. to yeah, say yeah. they have killed the baby yeah. mm-hmm. Whose the, initiative was that? Is the it the old, traditional birth attendant or the parent? The parents should not decide. It is the work of the midwife when she sees something abnormal. In very interior, remote areas where hospitals are far, do you think this still happens? Those ones still happens. Some places, those things must be going on. It is hidden, not as it was before. Yeah, secrets now. It is now a secret.
we're driving on a rough road now and we have been looking for a traditional bath attendant who has an incredible story. She ran away from her home. Looks like we're driving next to a swamp. Luckily it hasn't rained so the road isn't too bad. Here we are. Hello. We are quickly taken inside a small house made of mud to meet Zainab. She's travelled hundreds of miles to meet us at a secret location. She's had direct experience of delivering an intersex baby and it's changed her life. When I looked at the baby, I saw two things protruding. And when the mother looked, she saw that it had male and female parts. When the husband arrived, he said, we can't take this baby home. We want this baby to be killed. But I told him that this was God's creation and must not be killed. And then I told him, leave the baby with me. I'll kill it for you. But I did not kill it. I kept it. Two years went by and I delivered a baby exactly like the other one. In this case, the mother just fled and left me with the baby. That brought me a lot of problems with my husband. He is a fisherman, and when he went out to the lake to fish and had a bad catch, he said it was because the children had brought a curse on us. He suggested I give him the children so he could drown them in the lake. But I refused. We started fighting all the time. I was forced to flee with the children. Do you regret taking these children? Maybe this was God's plan. They are human beings. I have to take care of God's creation. You, you clearly like their parents. They are my children now. <laughs> it's me they call mommy. Should I throw them out? No, I am their mom. This is where the children live. This is the house of the children for female and, okay. and male. Apostle Dallan has also created an unconventional family through his church. And you, it's not Thank just you. the children, it's yeah. also the grannies. I'm told the oldest is 84. Uh, many of them are either widows or they never got children. One have been introduced to got 11 children, but all of them died. And so they have no one to take care of them. And they have come here to the mission center and this is where they live now. Uh, they take Apostle Dellen as their child who's taking care of them. <laughs> it's just ask them to stand up so you can see some dance. <laughs> <laughs> Through his church, Dallan has formed a community where he is adored. But it still took him 35 years to admit publicly who he is. Do you know, I was born an amorphodite, but uh, my mother tried to hide this. She took me to the hospital and I was given some drugs to boost my hormones because I wanted people to identify me as a man. So your mother raised you as a boy? As a boy. And even me, I thought that I was a boy because that was the mind I had. But physical changes, it comes... Around adolescence. Uh, adolescent stage. I started uh, experiencing menstruation period. Then my mom took me to the store and uh, the doctor told me, you know, you have both two organs inside you. The woman in you is more powerful than man in you. How did yeah. that affect you and the I relationships thought, you had with other people? Nobody would associate with me. Even in the family, nobody could even come near me. Only my mom. I was just like abomination to anybody. When I'm amongst men, they despised me. When I'm amongst women, they despised me. Some people attacked me. Some people wanted to take out my clothes just to see how I was created. I thought of even killing myself. What it, stopped you? My mom came and she told me, even though people denied you or reject you, God loves you. Because my mama was a religious woman. She used to encourage me that it was God who did that. It was not a mistake. God never 
do mistakes. So I'm not a mistake. There is a joy in my heart that no one can not give. But it comes from the Lord. My life to Him I give. The one thing Dallin was good at was singing. He quickly became famous for his gospel music in Western Kenya. He also formed his own church. Christianity has a big influence in the daily lives of people here. Religious leaders play a key role in shaping attitudes. I, as a pastor, I was against LGBTI community, intersex. I was very much against them. I was choosing my Bible. I can say to hammer them. Like many men of the cloth in Kenya, Pastor Walter Angienda was homophobic. The acronym LGBTI is common in the country. Lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender groups have for long worked closely with some intersex people. One such local organization took Pastor Walter through a training course. Before that training, even, even coming to the church, I'll say, you are not supposed to intermingle with us because you are a sinner already. In our community, as a Luo, a child born with two organs is abomination. It will bring a lot of things in the community, curses, whatever. But after this training, I realized they are just human beings like us, and they are the creation of God. It was that realization that turned Pastor Walter into an unlikely intersex advocate. I heard some rumors that uh, we have a two-in-one, the way they call it. We have a two-in-one person in this area. So I asked them, who is this two-in-one? And they explained it to me. He's still young, but uh, he's locked in the house. Pastor Walter tracked down and befriended Bernard. His sex was unclear at birth, but his parents really wanted a son, so Bernard was raised a boy. It was meant to be the family's secret, until Pastor Walter coaxed him out of the shadows and convinced Bernard's mother to let him join his church at school. Although Bernard is 14, he's missed so much schooling, he's in a kindergarten class, but he loves it all the same. I asked his teacher how he's getting on. Bernard is very lovely. When he comes in the morning, he comes and hugs you, teacher, how are you? He's a very jovial oh, Very child. jovial and so friendly. You are also aware of his condition, yeah, how he was born. I know. Do you treat him any differently because of that? He needs the extra special care. And when going to the toilet, he has to go alone. So the other children cannot see what is inside him. And Bernard is 14 now, and this is the time when children then develop Mm. because of adolescence. Mm. Have you noticed anything? I've noticed the apes started to broaden up. The breasts are coming out. Even the face you can now see is now becoming a very beautiful girl. So Bernard is developing into more of a girl. Yeah, me, what I'm seeing in him, I'm seeing she's a girl, not a boy. In a century-old mission hospital outside Nairobi, parents with children like Bernard queue patiently to see specialist doctors. No one knows for sure how many Kenyans are intersex, but the average is between 1.7 and 3% of any population. In Kenya, that means between 750,000 and 1.3 million people. And more and more of them are accessing healthcare services. We have a new set of parents who are willing to seek help Within these parents, there's internet that is accessible and available for them, even in the rural areas. So when they realize there's something wrong, they're able to just look and see, what could this possibly be? Dr. Joyce Mbogo has 32 child patients, as well as adults who come to see her at her clinic in Nairobi. She's one of a new crop of Kenyan doctors trained specifically to deal with what she calls disorders of sex development, or DSDs. I am actually a product of the training that was done within Africa by the European Society of Pediatric Endocrinologists. And we trained within our population, within our culture. So we have had more people graduating with this kind of specialty. Now, the people who have graduated, like me, have gotten involved 
heavily in sensitizing the community. And I believe that's the reason why we are having more coming up and seeking help. This is changing the way families deal with intersex children. They now have professionals like Dr. Mbogo to turn to. But she says as doctors, they don't have the instant solutions the parents come hoping for. It's a journey they've got to work with the children and their families. So for some people, you will not require anything at all. For others, you may require medication. For some conditions, it's just because you are lacking a hormone and therefore being given that chemical that you're lacking stabilizes everything. The other one is some require just some correction of the external genitalia. However, because it is a process and we believe the child should be at an age in which they can make that conscious decision, you would want to delay the surgery as much as possible. And therefore, doing it at an early age will also not only reduce the amount of surgeries that you need to do, but also the patient would have made a conscious decision of who they want to be. It may sound logical, but legally, there are some barriers to this approach. Lady Justice Teresia Matheka is a high court judge. She got interested in intersex issues after she came across such a child in her court. She's in touch with intersex people across the country and says they all face the same legal problem. As persons, our existence is defined by law. The Death and Birth Registration Act, you have to fill in you're either male or female. There's no room for any other situation. You need a birth certificate <laughs> even to go to school, you know, to sit your exams. My recommendation would just be we need to amend that act. First of all, to be able to allow the intersex person or child to get a document that identifies them and that may become permanent when actually their body tells them exactly or they decide who they are. And in any case, there are those intersex persons who don't want to be identified as either male or female. I'm just intersex. So if we could just perform that as a society and just say, this is who this person is and let them put it there, I'm intersex. I'm not male, I'm not female, I am intersex. That would be great for them because no parent would be worried. They know the law recognizes my, my child the way my child is and they'll just lead a normal life because it starts there. But now, some baby steps. In October, a group of intersex people marched through the streets of Nairobi to present a petition to Parliament. They want laws created to protect them. Some are even calling for a third gender. They are backed by lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and genderqueer activists. My name is Neo Senafolo Musangi, a non-binary Kenyan or genderqueer or gender non-conforming. Basically, I am a person that doesn't feel or identify as male or female or man or woman. And, you know, physically, it's difficult to place you in either of the two genders, either male or female. I can see you have short hair, uh, dyed color blue, uh, very striking, and even though you have a deep voice, there's no beard, and from your structure, it's difficult to classify you as either male or female. Where do you stand in the discussion about third gender? I'm totally for third gender in this country because particularly with intersex persons, parents would not be compelled to have to take a gender or a sex for their children, for an infant, who then grows up and becomes opposite or non-binary, right? So I think having a third gender from the very beginning would allow space for people to choose the gender that they feel comfortable in uh, much later in life, post-puberty. Apart from the intersex people, do you see any other group that might need the third gender? I totally think I would fall into the third gender category. Transgender people, non-binary people, intersex people. It would be helpful to have a third gender that allows you to not necessarily live with the trauma of your assigned at birth sex. Neo's hope is exactly what conservative groups in the country fear. They see the campaign for intersex rights as part of a wider attack on traditional binary understandings of gender and sexuality. Charles Kanjama is a lawyer in Nairobi and a member of the Kenya Christian Professionals Forum. The advocacy for rights of intersex persons is relied upon by 
homosexuals, gays, and lesbians, and particularly by transgender persons, people who decide to make their own choice to advocate for the blurring of lines about sexual identity and orientation. It is basically a Trojan horse that is being used by those who would like to advocate the complete uh, raising to the ground of traditional sexual identities, orientation, and behavior. Christian lawyers successfully argued against the recognition of intersex people in a recent legal test case. The court agreed with them that it could set a tricky precedent. The moment you open the ground for a third gender, don't think you'll stop at a third gender. Actually, you will uh, end up with a great diversity of genders. You will end up excluding those who want to live their lives according to the awareness or recognition of two genders from being part of society. This is the story of the elephant that uh, during the rain uh, went to the African hut and requested the owner of the hut to allow the trunk to shelter from the rain. And after the owner thought, yes, I can allow the trunk to shelter from the rain soon, the elephant wanted to get the head in so that the ears could also shelter from the rain. And soon one leg, two legs, eventually the elephant got into the hut and dislocated the person who had been sheltering from the rain. Back in Western Kenya, Dalan has found his own way to rise above stigma. But intersex people have not had their day in court. Many still want to be either male or female, and they are pushing for legal and medical support to achieve their goal. But there are those, like Dalan, who have accepted themselves as they are and would rather not change their bodies to conform to societal expectations. If I could go back to my childhood, I would have not even allowed my mom to identify me as a man. She would have left it for me to identify myself how I want it to be. Yeah. And knowing all that you know now, yeah, yeah. how would you have identified yourself? I would have identified myself as an intersex. Not as a man and not as a woman. An intersex, because I have both of them. And God never do mistakes. I would like the government to give a space for an intersex because I accept and I agree that there are female and male in this world. And again, there are intersex and hermaphrodites, so they should be given their gender and be defined as a gender in the constitution that we have intersex in the society. Kenya is a conservative country and many people are reluctant to accept gay and transgender people. What surprises me as a Kenyan is how open people have become in a short space of time to the idea of intersex rights. Just a year ago, it was a taboo subject, but people like Dallon have made it mainstream. A third gender may be a long way off, but intersex Kenyans are stepping out of the shadows. Thanks for listening to that edition of Crossing Continents. The presenter was BBC Africa's health correspondent, Anne Soy. Next week, Linda Presley will be reporting on Cuba's cancer revolution. Cancer revolution. Cancer revolution. Cancer revolution.